Welcome, everyone. We're very happy that so many of you could join us tonight uh, for our Acre Forum presentation. Um, we're very excited, of course, to have our speaker, Dr. Brian Mitchell. Um, many of you know Dr. Mitchell's background in academia, uh, what he's working now in higher education. Uh, I've been following, maybe stalking, Dr. Mitchell <laughs> since 1983. Uh, Early this summer, he was speaking at a group for the Irish Partnership uh, with UMass Lowell, and I was pleased to introduce him at the time. I probably scared him off a little bit because I told him that since his book, the, the history of the Irish in Lowell is being rewritten even as we speak, and it started with this one man. Here, to prove it, here is the invitation from 1983. So, yeah, I told you, I've been stalking you. Could I have that? Yes, if you would, yeah, sure. No, I have several, never mind, let's <laughs> go. But since Dr. Mitchell produced his book back in 1983 and started that research, uh, the earliest uh, history of the Irish in Lowell was George O'Dwyer's Irish Catholic Genesis, and God rest George's soul, but he was a great storyteller. He told many truths, but he also collected a lot of memories, like myself, and never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Uh, but Dr. Mitchell you know, put together the first real history of the Irish in Lowell. Once he left, and I don't know if he knew everything that happened after that, we started doing our own research, and many historians here in the city, amateur and professional, started researching what was going on. Uh, some of you know of the work that we've done in St. Patrick's Cemetery with 1,500 names of the original Irish pioneers in the inscriptions of their gravestones. Those were never recorded before, and those are now in the cemetery office. We also found original uh, cemetery records that nobody else knows about. And we found those, there are 10,000 names of unmarked Irish uh, many of them unmarked Irish graves, and we found those names from the original records, and those now also are in cemetery office for those who are interested in genealogy. Recently in the cemetery, we just did the first real census of civil war, of course, this being the anniversary, and we've done the first real census of civil war, Irish civil war, Lowell veterans who died during the war and were later, or later buried in the cemetery. You also probably know about the three years of archaeological digs that have been going on in the front yard of St. Patrick's Parish. The first year we found 1,532 artifacts with the outline of an original shanty from the period. So all this great information is going on and it started with Dr. Mitchell. Without his work, the story of Lowell's Irish is unique and not unique. We're the same story that happened in so many other cities, but this, what happens to Lowell Irish really does have a certain viewpoint, and we want to make sure that that's preserved. A culture that doesn't celebrate its past loses it. So you being here, we're carrying on that culture, that heritage that's been passed down to us. And we want to thank this gentleman for keeping, keeping the flame alight and going, Dr. Mitchell. Well, we have to start with the obvious. What happens if the main speaker isn't as engaging or funny as the guy who sets him up? <laughs> so we have a problem, I think, there. I want to start uh, at the outset by saying I want to thank a number of folks, including the Lowell Irish Cultural Committee and the AOH, um, for their uh, willingness, I think, to reintroduce the ACA Forum uh, to Lowell. I think and believe strongly that the ability of all of us to begin to think carefully and productively about the role that the Irish played uh, is uh, critical. And I want to thank Dave in particular for working so hard to coordinate my visit with others uh, here tonight. Um, I, I should say something about the Acre Forum. My recollection is that I've spoken before uh, at the Acre Forum back in the late 1980s. In those days, I was working for the National Endowment for the Humanities in Washington, DC. The topic was about a new wave of immigrants uh, that were coming, as we've seen, uh, to uh, Lowell in such dramatic numbers. I shared the podium that night, if I remember, with Paul Songus, uh, 
And I think what I remember most about that event is that my sister and my mother-in-law and my father-in-law uh, were in the audience, uh, and I was doing the very, very best I could to impress them. Uh, Mary Jane and uh, our sons were both at work and school in Washington, D.C., and I was very much on my own, and I was really quite nervous. Now, as I opened my speech in those days, uh, we used slides as opposed to PowerPoint presentations, which are common now. And as I turned on my slides, I realized I had put them in incorrectly. Now, the, the audience, I think, had maybe four or 500, principally, I think, because Paul Songus was there. And so it was a fairly significant moment. And I remember thinking to myself, this is what flop sweat must feel like. <laughs> And I can still remember my first comment. I suggested, and I think my sister might remember this, that I would open my remarks with a heightened level of unexpected audience participation. Accordingly, I said, as we begin, I would like you all to take the opportunity to stand on your heads so you can see the very important slides uh, that I have shown and put in upside down. They laughed a little bit like you did, uh, and my in-laws were kind enough to men never mention it to me then or since. Uh, I asked my father-in-law, Mary Jane doesn't know this, Dan Murphy, because he raised it, he's now 95 years old, a couple of weeks ago, about his perspective on marrying his daughter. We've been married, we met when we were 16, and we've been married for 38 years. He said, and I quote here verbatim, he was not, quote, all that worried. He said, I was a pretty regular guy, his daughter seemed happy, and most important to him, and it was the most important thing to him, I was Irish after all. <laughs> The Irish part, I think, closed the deal. And I, I can also remember um, that we had a good and lively discussion. And my point, of course, for the forum is that I think if we can uh, operate uh, in good faith for a couple of years, we can get back to the numbers uh, that we enjoyed back in the 80s. And I hope that we do that. I, I'll also say, just as an aside, that I'm also aware that, flame, that fame itself can be a fleeting thing. Now, I usually speak on higher education. That's what I do professionally for a living. Uh, and I was on uh, Monday night with uh, Dan Ray, I think it is, on Nightside on WBZ uh, from a 9 at 10 o'clock talking about the massive challenges that higher education is facing today. Dan and I hit it off. We were, got pretty friendly for that hour, and things went very well. I turned 60 a couple of weeks ago, and I was at Massachusetts General the next day getting my, now that I'm qualified, shingles shot. The nurse technician heard my voice in my name and said, and again I quote verbatim, I know you, you're famous. So I stood up and kind of flexed my, my uh, what is that, muscle I guess, flexed my muscle as best I could to prepare for the flu shot. And then she said, you're Dan Ray's friend on the radio. <laughs> so thanks to you, Dave, for that very kind introduction. But fame can be fairly fle fleeting and take on new meetings, but I come to you tonight as Dan Ray's friend. <laughs> I want to talk to you a little bit, and we want to get the Irish introduced on the stage, but I'm not going to talk initially too much about the Irish, and I'd like to facilitate the discussion as best I could with as many uh, questions. So we're going to make sure we leave good, a good amount of time for questions. But I think tonight we should probably begin by, by setting the stage. Um, as Dave suggested, we've done a good deal of work tonight through research and through material culture uh, groups like what's happening at University of Massachusetts at Lowell here at Middlesex, at Queens, Col Queens University in Belfast, the St. Patrick's Day dig, what's being done at the cemeteries, they're all ma material culture, basic research, whatever it is, it's all incredibly relevant to what is an exceptionally significant Irish community for reasons that I'll describe in a second. I think we can admire how the Irish acclimated and maintained at the same time a kind of separate, unapologetic, and at times defensive position in a world in which they felt very dearly the notion that Irish need not apply. Now, I'm, I'm tempted, I think, to remember the song that gained significance. Uh, you hear it, I think, at the National Park and other times as well. I've heard it sung as recently as uh, Mary Jane and I were at the McCourt theatrical performance in uh, Davis Square in Somerville a couple of Sundays ago. Uh, the lines go, do you think it a misfortune to be christened Pat or Dan, to me it is an honor to be born an Irishman. That, I think, defines the, the sort of tenor of the presentation that I want to make for you tonight. Let me see if I can really stress this so we can understand the significance, because in some respects, 
with apologies to the National Park Service and elsewhere, I think and believe strongly that it's the one thing maybe that's missing about the story in Lowell. And it, it can be stated very simply, what's missing in Lowell, I think and believe, is the remarkable nature of the story. We forget the sense of wonder we should feel about this particular Irish community. And let me explain by that what I mean. In some respects, the parallels to what's happening today in Boston or Austin or Palo Alto in California are striking. So here's what I mean. Now, the first premise to describe the subject for our conversation tonight is to accept the fact that Lowell was the largest planned industrial community in the United States before the American Civil War. I think what we have to understand, though, is that the Irish entered the stage at what was one at what at the point at which they entered was one of the most extraordinary reimaginings in American history. It's not just that the Irish came to Lowell, it's that they came to an idea. I, I dropped the R because I've lived away from Boston for 25 years. It's still very hard to do that, but it is possible. So let's start with Boston. Boston in 1820 was the fourth largest city in the United States. If it had, recall correctly, it had a population of 42,298. The tenth largest city was Salem, Massachusetts, uh, to give you an idea of large cities. Uh, New York was the largest. It was a little bit larger than Lowell. It had about 120,000 people in it. That's the largest city uh, in North America, the, in the, what was then the old American colonies. And it's decades, obviously, after the close of the, at least the initiation of the revolution. The second largest city was Philadelphia. When you add the Philadelphia suburbs, it was 62,000. It was probably up around 90 or 100,000. Uh, the third largest city was Baltimore, and Boston was fourth. 42,000 people. My point is that this United States, into which the Irish are about to play such a large role in Lowell, was profoundly agrarian. It was, uh, you know, as, as I'll thicken my accent since I am from Lowell, it was a bunch of farmers. <laughs> it really was. And we have to understand that. So what role did Boston play? Well, Boston historically was the entrep entrepreneur port. It didn't make anything. It had some timber coming through it, and it had other kinds of things. The, the, as we all know, when we try to put our tomatoes in in the summer, the soil is rotten. There's not much there that it has to offer. But it did trade in rum and slaves. And so it had, in that respect, a pretty good trade going. And there was some money to be made in rum and slaves. But the, the 1820 Boston, the, the place that is about to reimagine America's 19th century experience, was a place that was essentially running out of cash and running out of time. We're at the end of the rum and slave trade, as we know. And what that means, essentially, is that you have to begin to think about where the next generation, or even your generation, is going to make some money. Now, as you think about it, there's very little in the way of corporate law. Corporate law would define how structures are put into place to found cities like Lowell. Because all of it is new. So you don't have the kinds of things that you would ordinarily need. They become important soon, but the foundation of banks and insurance companies and legal firms, they're embryonic at best. You know, they're there, but they're not there to imagine the kind of scale that you'd have to think about. There's much to build upon in the future, but we're not there yet. Now, this is where I need for you as an audience to start imagining this world. Imagine that you're an Appleton or a Lowell. You're one of the wealthy Boston families who have made some money and you want to keep it. And preferably, you want to grow it if you can. And try to imagine it in terms of today's thinking. There's no government subsidy. There's no set of tax breaks. There's no economic development arm. There's no venture capital firm. Yet, when you think about it, here is the proposal that brings the Irish onto the center stage. So I'll play the role of the, the Boston associate, and you can play the role of a Palo Alto venture capitalist in the 21st century. We come to you today, my associates, my family, and myself, and my friends, and we'd like to do something extraordinary. We want to put together a project that would combine land, land acquisition, water, transportation, power, labor, and capital. Now, it doesn't either exist right now or we have to put it together, but let me go on. 
We'd like to locate it along a riverbank with no access to any of the ports in or near Boston. Sounds pretty attractive so far, huh? Now, we want to finance it, most of it ourselves. If, unless you're interested, we want to finance most of it ourselves. The construction is large, probably will extend. In those days, they probably thought over 15 years, but in fact, most of the construction would extend into the 1850s, so it's at least 40 years. And we're going to need a very large group of laborers that, by and large, don't exist. The buildings we'll construct will also need a labor force. We don't really have it, but we were thinking of trying something new to pull uh, young women from the farms of central and northern New England, which are becoming depopulated anyways, because all the men are moving to uh, Syracuse and Rochester and Cleveland uh, and Erie, Pennsylvania, and Cincinnati. So the farms are going back to the countryside as well, and these women really have no place to go. And I'm sure they'll come if we ask. Are you persuaded yet? Exactly. Uh, and then also, we'll dig the transportation canal, 26 miles of digging uh, from Lowell to the Mystic River, from Lowell to Boston. Now, how are we going to do it? This is the part that really will make the sales, sirs and ladies and gentlemen, so we want you to, to really think hard on this because we know you're with us once you, you hear this. We'll steal the plans. And we'll do it from England because we think we have pretty good minds and we think we remember, well, most of it. Now, you're a Palo Alto venture capitalist the whole time, and you're being pitched about why you give your money to this venture. Okay? Uh, we'll take water from the canals that we've dug with laborers who we have never met. We don't know how well they work. We'll have it flow over water wheels that are connected to leather belts and straps and pulleys that are connected to machines in perfect sync that we've been experimenting on in a little experiment in Waltham, Massachusetts, to take us beyond the thread production facilities we've seen in sort of small-scale development in Pawtucket and in Rhode Island. And we'll use the same water in the same way from a second and have it dump into a second canal and then reuse it and dump it back into the river. Now we've tested the Waltham concept as kind of our beta site and we can do this and then what we will do is we will sell cheap cotton cloth to the world but particularly to the plantations in the American South. Oh, and because we're putting most of the money into it, we'll name it after ourselves. Now, if you'd like by a show of hands to say who'd like to put money in on that right now, I'd be happy to take any hands that might want to be raised. The point is, what the hell were they thinking? You know, when one thinks about it, you can imagine, if you're trying to reimagine a society that was agrarian with no urban population centers, no train workforce, no transportation links, no real venture capital, no government subsidies, nothing there to suggest other than an experiment in Waltham that you were about to stake your family's finances, or at least a, a bloody big chunk of them, on the future of a town that didn't exist. And that's where we bring in the Irish. Because what we need right now is we need cheap labor. So we'll tell the story, and it's told by the Park Service and elsewhere about the mill girls some other time. It's time to introduce the Irish now. So where are you going to find them? Well, it turns out that there are Irish working in gangs throughout New England in small groups, and there are core developments in what now would be South Boston and certainly in Charlestown and other kinds of places. And we'll use Hugh Comiskey as an example. Uh, Hugh comes in, if I recall, about, from Tyrone in about 1817, if I remember, and he goes to Charlestown and he opens a brewery, and he develops a work gang and now, I I'm the, was the president of Bucknell University, which has one of the top 10 engineering programs in the United States. We feed a lot of our engineers uh, into development operations and into engineering firms that build big things like AECOM and uh, Bechtel and so on. That's what places like Bucknell do. I can tell you that the level of preparation for those people to understand what they're doing is significant. So here we have a group of people that are largely self-financing one of the great construction projects of the first half of the, of the 19th century using labor that has no particular talent, no particular skill, and in fact is a group of disconnected folks whose only loyalty is to somebody like the foreman like you who can pay them a weekly wage. They have no training and they're going to have to rely on a relationship between Hugh Comiskey and Kirk Booth. 
and that's how they came. That's the labor force. Again, if you're that venture capitalist, what the heck were they thinking? Because that's it. That's all you can do. You know you can probably attract, if you create this immigrant, if you create this industrial utopia, the farm women, if you can create a certain kind of put in St. Anne's Church kind of mindset in place, but you've got to attract these Irish laborers. And then once you get them, what do you do with them? That's also a problem. You've got to imagine all this. You've got to always be two steps ahead. Anybody who's run anything complex knows this if you're, if you're in an open competition. You've got to be two steps ahead trying to figure out what comes next, where are they coming from, how do you accommodate them. It goes well beyond simply paying them a wage. And you've got to figure it out. So for the first time, and I've never said a good word about Kirk Boot in my life until tonight, but tonight's the night. Imagine you're a Kirk, Kirk Boot in your late 20s, early, middle 30s, he dies, I think, at the age of 46, if I can recall correctly, probably well in his 30s by now. And you're trying to imagine all this. You're trying to find qualified engineers to dig power canals onto which factories can be placed that look and feel respectable in terms of this kind of rural, idyllic version that they have that have boarding houses attached to them that are almost religious in overtone and that are meant to improve the intellectual minds of the largely but not exclusively unmarried women you're attracting from farms that are collapsing in central and northern New England next door to Irish work gangs. Kirk Boot, I submit tonight, has a real problem. Now the gangs that come are male. But I want to make a, a qualification here. I'm going to this is the first time I've ever said it. I actually, Dave, I want to test this out on the, uh, as a theory tonight. I wish I'd said it in the book 20 or more years ago. In some respects, they were better prepared for what was about to face them than, in fact, the folks who lived in this agrarian society into which the Irish had entered, in some cases, many years before. Here's what I mean. It is, Ireland is part of the United Kingdom, or would become part of the United Kingdom. It's, yeah, I guess by then it was part of the United Kingdom in terms of the, the formation of the, of the UK. There are enough papers going back and forth that they understand in, the, in, the, uh, in Ireland and in, in the British Isles generally what's happening in Lancashire, which is the industrial sector of England. They also can begin, particularly in Northern Ireland, where Hugh Comiskey is from, they can begin to see the first patterns of pre-industrial society emerging in cities like Belfast, in towns then like Belfast. There's enough knowledge going on, and in fact perhaps better knowledge, of what's going on as these folks, often coming from Northern Ireland through Canada or other places, but largely through Canada, to Lowell, to imagine in some respects what Kurt Boot has in mind, and I would submit tonight more so than the very people who lived uh, and would eventually become part of the town. Because they knew enough in terms of what their experiences were as the first stirrings of industrialization were occurring in England. And they read enough, they understood enough, they'd heard enough, and it wasn't all that surprising to them in a way that for the resident American population and uh, native-born American population, it probably was. So for, for somebody like an Irish foreman like you, for example, an Irish foreman working uh, for Kirk Boot. The, pro the proposition that Boot presented to him was a really good proposition in terms of being able to be paid a wage for a good period of time. You know, it's like being a long-term consultant. You can see years into your future there if you can keep your work gang and if you can deliver. But at the same time, it would be less surprising than you might think. The key, though, was probably the relationship between Boot and the Irish foreman, or Boot and his people and the Irish foreman. That, I think, is important because a number of things have to occur if they're going to live in the ramshackle paddy camps, what became eventually the Acre, in such close proximity to the Merrimack Manufacturing Company, to the boarding houses. You cannot have a kind of religious-oriented, pastoral, idyllic setting if, in fact, you're going to have a series of paddy camps that are perhaps not nice to look at but are disorderly because you won't be able to attract the women because it's a bad neighborhood. So you have to begin to think about those relationships with the Irish almost at the beginning. 
And it's pretty interesting to think about. I don't think we've ever imagined the psychology of what it was like to move the Irish to Lowell. And when you think about it, these folks are really ahead of their time. So where does that leave us? Well, I think as we begin to think about this, we have to imagine what's going through Boot, Kirk Boot's mind. And just ask yourself, it could be any number of things. Was it, for example, uh, what I do is I get the labor in and out as quickly as possible. We know we need to build some canals and some mills. We get them in, it's not temporary. We make sure basically that we keep things in order. Once they're done, they move on. That's the tradition here in New England. Was it build the Middlesex Canal and get the first power canals, then the mills and boarding house and church until one could find better labor? Maybe you could stop the Yankee labor, that is the male labor from being drained into cities like Rochester and, and Cincinnati. Was it, my options are limited because the American West has opened as a safety valve and it's draining all that labor to the Rochesters and Cincinnati where the land is better and the future is bright, so this is the only game in town and I'm going to have to play that card. Or more likely, was it a project by project build out that requires changes in the evolution of the labor force as time continued? So when you look at it from a manager's perspective, it's different from the classical way we, the Irish in Lowell, tell the story about the Irish. My guess, and this is just a hunch, and I'd like to see some of the recent research to see if I'm, I'm right about this, is that he probably brought the Irish in on a project-by-project -project basis. Now the first camps, as we all know from our research, were clannish, they were male, and they largely responded to the foreman. The foreman was critical. It was a question of discipline. Regular work, discipline, and regular wages. That's how those first camps were defined. My guess is Boot and some of his, his uh, senior overseers probably thought the camps were temporary. And I think in the early days, with the, even with, through the construction in the late 1820s with the first Catholic church at St. Patrick's, these were probably efforts to sort of keep the peace, to give people an alternative. I, I came, as you know, I, I was a, a college or university president for 15 years at strong, what we would call jock fraternity schools. And as my wife and I, Mary Jane and I can attest to, I spent a whole lot of time trying to imagine what the fraternity boys would do if they weren't behaving like fraternity boys and how could we help them do it. And he had the same problem. He had to try to imagine what you could do, in fact, in terms of pro providing an alternative. It was a little bit easier because the work was so steady in Lowell. It was a relatively good time economically in the American economy. And the work was so steady in Lowell that they didn't leave. And as they stayed, families begin to, began to emerge. People got married. Families began to emerge. And the neighborhood that had been a series of paddy camps became a neighborhood in real life, became the acre of the acre forum. So why? What I would argue, and I think what I say in the book fairly clearly, and I think I'd even say it more strongly now, is that St. Patrick's Church, I'm a practicing Catholic, so this is no disparagement on Catholicism at all, the Catholic Church was a very good form of social control. What it did is it answered the question of what families needed in terms of an organizing principle that they would understand that was set up on their terms. Because obviously they were not going to go to an Episcopal Church and they were not going to participate, nor would they be allowed to participate in this Yankee experiment of factory farm women. Now the second issue became even more prob problematic because the work was steady. So we also began to see the first, it's a very small group, but you can see Hugh Comiskey is part of it eventually as he's a constable and other kinds of things, of merchants and clergymen and of course wives. And as the camps stabilized into the acre, the town of Lowell was for the first time forced to accept infrastructure costs. I can think of, there were lots of infrastructure costs. There were gas lit lamps. There's roads. Uh, there wouldn't be sidewalks necessarily, but there were laws and town ordinances and things they had to worry about and health concerns. And also there's the question of what to do with the children. So there's a school issue. So again, let's go back and play the role of, Hugh, of Kirk Boot tonight. You're Kirk Boot. Basically, just build me the mills and leave, except that there's enough profit that the Merrimack Mills became the Hamilton Mills and the Appleton Mills and, the, and so on, the Lawrence Mills eventually and so on. So you're having this continuous stream, a growing but not overly large but sizable Irish population 
that has become family oriented, that is being paid regular wages, and so this is a good deal, pre-famine, a very different condition in class, if you will, of Irish, not literally but figuratively, but a very different group of Irish, and we're in a situation now where you have to figure out what to do. The only thing you can do is to begin to put the infrastructure in place. Now, there are two approaches. The first approach is the sensible one. If only everyone would just get along. And so as you read those relationships in the 20s and 30s, what you see are the Yankee elders of Lowell participating in St. Patrick's Day activities and vice versa. When Kirk uh, Boot died, Hugh Comiskey called him my dear departed friend, if I remember correctly. Um, that's a stretch. Unless you understood the nature, the sort of, the sort of very close psychological and social relationship that had to occur between people like you and others as they began to look at where, in fact, their role in life was structured relative to the experience going on in Lowell. The second problem was to impose order. If these are work camps and they are male-dominated and the culture and traditions are very different than the puritanical culture and traditions that have characterized the development of the Massachusetts Bay Colony historically, and we're not that far away from the Massachusetts Bay Colony in these days, then they're going to have to find a way in which the two worlds can coexist when the approach and outlook of each world is very different. So we have to think about how, how they can impose order. And what I would submit to you tonight is they've came down to a decision. We'll do the best we can to get along with the elders, with the generation that's in place now, but it doesn't look like they're leaving, nor does it look like Lowell will do anything but, continuing, but continue to expand. Despite the panic of 1837, there's a brief blip, but it looks like things are going, and there's a rebuilding in the 40s and 50s, as you know. So we're not going to really worry about that generation, but we're going to treat them differently, but we are going to worry about the children. Now, my dad was a high school history teacher at Lowell High, and as I, I was saying to a uh, Middlesex uh, College, uh, community college student, all my family are school teachers, including my sister, uh, except uh, my mother, I guess, in, in my family. Wonderful world to grow up in, but Lowell High, a place I have only fond memories of and love dearly, although I'm a Keith Academy guy, the year it closed, uh, a place clearly that I, I came to respect, I came to respect deeply. Uh, was basically a place that was set up as the most progressive and first public high school in the United States, largely to answer the question of what to do with the children of Irish immigrants. If you can't win the first generation over, make sure you win the second. And how do you do that? Well, something's going to have to happen in Lowell. The women that are coming into Lowell as Yankee factory women and the Irish that are coming up uh, in what is historically an agrarian tradition in Ireland, even though it's beginning to industrialize a little bit in the north, they're on an agrarian work cycle. Lowell High School set up and was one of the first and best examples in this country of an industrial work rhythm. You have to train them to the clock. Because if you can do that, you can make the Irish antecedents, the successors of the first generation, much more like the industrial world that Lowell is developing and evolving into. And so Lowell High was essentially a place to regularize the Irish. It was a place to translate an agrarian work cycle into an industrial work rhythm. And it was a very, very intuitive kind of decision because by the 1840s, it is the Irish next generation, particularly the, Irish, the young Irish girls who graduated from the public schools in Lowell, who have the first doors open to them after the labor unrest among the Yankee factory women uh, in terms of new employees in these mills. You have to bear the infrastructure costs, as I suggested earlier. And that takes us to 1845. So those are the deals that are struck. Lowell High is founded. Everything is basically in order. The acre is established. There are plans afoot to build a stronger, bigger, brighter St. Patrick's Church. Everything is where it should be. And then here comes the famine. 
Now, I often wonder, not so much about what the Yankees, we have a good idea what the Yankees thought about the famine Irish when they came to Lowell. And remember, Lowell was a place where the workload was increasing, the water, as the scale increased, became increasingly impure. The air in sealed factories was not where it needed to be, so evidence of tuberculitis, tuberculitis tuberculosis, evidence of consumption, to, uh, evidence of uh, diarrhea, evidence of cholera and yellow fever became increasingly problematic as the city grew in scale. And the city is beginning to boom again in the 1840s, and then here comes the wave of that next generation of largely rural agrarian Irish desperately fleeing to America on coffin ships to try to survive. Now we know, as I said, from the, from the newspapers and other accounts, what uh, the uh, Yankee Lowell uh, thought about them. Uh, they thought about them, I, in some respects, much like in the late 20th century, I think a lot of Lowellians thought about the next wave of immigrants who came from Southeast Asia. You know, I often smile when I hear that because I often, I think to myself that 150 years ago they were saying that about my generation, my ancestors, they were saying the same thing about my ancestors that people would be saying in the late 20th century about the next wave of immigrants coming to Lowell. Some of it is always born in fact, the, the politics, the traditions, the cultures, the gangs, they're all different, but in a sense they're different because they're the same, just 150 years difference. What I don't think we understand and appreciate, though, is what must the resident Irish have thought about the famine? Now, they're cousins uh, and friends and from the old town, and yet here they come sweeping in after all these intense psychosocial negotiations had occurred. They come sweeping into Lowell, and they overwhelm it. If ever there was a need for a hospital, and this is the first stirrings of the, of the hospitals in Lowell, this is the time. Because the famine immigrants were not healthy, they were coming into a situation that was less healthy every day, and that made for a very unhealthy environment. My own studies suggest the average age for working uh, Irish women uh, at point of death was the middle 30s, uh, and the late 30s, very early 40s uh, for Irish men. Now, that's true in many er certainly uh, birth rates that are uh, lower than we would expect today is common uh, in mid-19th century America. That's, that's common. That's understood. But those are rates that are significantly and almost precipitously lower uh, than elsewhere. So what happens then? Well then, obviously we know from our records what goes on. There is the know-nothing attacks and uh, the smelling committees and all the things that make the history of Lowell, make the history of Lowell famous. Let's go back and, in, and investigate the original agreement. Kirk Boot by now is dead. Labor unrest has, pre has precipitated a fleeing, if in some respects, of Yankee farm women from the textile mills. The mills are growing in size. The uh, Harvard Yard style campus is being filled in. The space between the buildings, floors are added to them. And the mile of mills that we know, for those of us who are my age or older, and can, I can barely remember it, but I do remember it, uh, is in fact beginning to take shape in Lowell. So we have a situation where Lowell has merged into an immigrant industrial city. And I can imagine that there must have been two reactions among the Irish. The first reaction among the resident Irish was, we need to help. In the same way that we often say after Hurricane Sandy, we need to help the citizens out on Staten Island if they're a New Yorker. That makes all the sense in the world. But I can also imagine the resentment or at least an effort to control or preserve and, pre and, and retain what they had. And it was here, I'd argue to you tonight, that the Catholic Church really came to the forefront. I've often thought that if the Catholic Church was as ambitious as it had been in the 19th century, there would be, from cradle through career it's called in Irish, in immigration history, Literally, from the moment you were born to the day you died, there'd be a reason to be at the church every day, whether it was daycare or elderly care or all the things, CYO, all the things, the basketball league, the church social, whatever it was, a rationale for it being the cultural center that St. Patrick's became. And what I'd argue tonight is that's effectively the solution to handling the famine Irish. It allowed the church to emerge 
as the dominant force because it offered the best hope of protection against the Know Nothing movement, of a certain pride in the Irish in being Irish, of a certain ability to defend oneself until you began to get into politics, in eight, as Oscar Hanlon says, in 1860 and later, of an ability to make sure that the Irish traditions remained alive in Lowell, and as a gravitating point in terms of providing basic aid that would be necessary to survive and strengthen once one came, once one came to Lowell for the famine. But what's the upshot of all this? There is a final evolutionary point in both Lowell and in the Irish, and I think that's where I'll end the story tonight. For Lowell, this wonderful pastoral setting, you know, if you have that view of 1825 Lowell with St. Anne's in the center and a nice uh, first uh, Merrimack Manufacturing Company and the, and the sorry, and the uh, uh, boarding houses, you've got a really good sense of Lowell or at least the image that they want to create. You notice the paddy camps are not shown there. And there's a reason for that, as I've argued tonight. They were meant to be temporary, at least initially, or a problem that they would evolve and grow into and solve a little bit later. But the Lowell, by the time the American Civil War broke out, was a very different Lowell. It was large. It was, commis it was sort of like the Amos Keg Mill. It was imposing. Uh, it was one of the largest cities in the United States. Uh, it was a lot of people on a relatively a few square miles. And in that, in that 13 or 14 square miles became a, was built a series of neighborhoods uh, that starting with the Irish and then eventually extending to 35 to 40 more nationalities that represented some of the most heavy concentrations of immigrant populations anywhere outside of the Lower East Side in New York. But at the center of that industrial world that Lowell became was always the parish. And that parish defined for the Irish how they could take the agrarian Irish who came over in the famine and the resident Irish who'd had a much more of that early American experience, blend the two together and make it work. After the Civil War, other openings began to occur. Uh, there were by then Irish men in the locomotive works. There were Irish men uh, working uh, as foremen uh, in the factories. There was uh, a large contingent that had gone off to fight in the American Civil War. Uh, they came back to find uh, that there was even cheaper labor available in French Canada. And it became a period in time in which, while Lowell was still attractive, it was no longer the magnet uh, that it would be and clearly was before the American Civil War. So I'll conclude by saying this. First, hats off to the people who could imagine an experience. It didn't quite work out the way they wanted. But what an imagination they must have had. What a willingness to sort of bet the house in terms of trying to, to build a urban experience or at least a rural pastoral village experience based upon a pledge that they had in their own minds to sell cotton cloth to the world. What an amazing sort of uh, interposition of, of engineering and technology and cash and a willingness to find a way to bring the labor and the capital and the water and the technology and the transportation together in ways that we couldn't imagine today in this country and that no venture capitalists in Palo Alto today would ever fund. And yet it happened and the Irish played the role not so much as the managers but they were the foundation upon which the experiment was built. And I think that's the genius of the Irish experience in Lowell, that none of it would be possible without the intersection of labor, capital, technology. They represented the labor that made it happen. And they did so from the most unsuspecting, in the most unsuspecting kind of way because it was the Irish, after all, with no particular skills other than ditch digging built what was viewed, if you listen to Francis Trollope or Charles Dickens, was viewed as one of the great natural wonders of the world. No one making the American experience in the early middle years of the 19th century would think of coming to America without stopping either in Niagara Falls or Lowell because it was a marvel. And again, I I, uh, what I'll do now is I'll open it for questions and thank you for the experience of explaining my hypothesis to you tonight. 
So let's take some questions. Oh, there you go. Up there. Okay, what kind of questions? Yes, sir. Uh, well, 1837 was the beginning of labor discord. It was the panic of 1837. There had been a run on the markets. And so as a result, the economy, a little bit like today, the economy tanked. And what that did is it suspended a lot of the production, not to the extent one would think incidentally, but it suspended a lot of the construction and some of the production that, that uh, people had in mind. That production would pick up again in the early 1840s. And what was interesting about it, this was where uh, James McNeil Whistler's father was then the chief engineer at Locks and Canals, for example. This is the point where Lowell is beginning to think about using its water power better by going from, uh, to a turbine system. So we have these enormous turbine pits in the, wheel, in the uh, houses uh, on the Locks and Canal property right now, and then eventually would convert in the 1850s largely to steam. So what that meant is that at the point at which all of this was occurring, and they were beginning to think that, in fact, to speed up production and to compete with other towns that had been set up, like Lawrence in 1845 would be, like the Lawrences that were being planned in the Chicopees and the Holyoaks and in the 1850s and 60s, the Fall Rivers, that as they were beginning to imagine these plans coming, they knew they needed to keep, sort of, keep the infrastructure current in Lowell because it was wearing out. It had already depreciated fully. It was 20 years old. So the way they did that, as I said, is to make it larger and scale it up in a way that some of the, the scales in these larger towns, often built with some of the same money historically, uh, were being used as well. For the Irish, I, I would argue that the Panic of 1837 was a real opportunity because what it did essentially is cause labor unrest among the Yankee women, the factory women, to increase. And in fact, people began to imagine that they had tapped out that market and that the costs of maintaining the benevolent societies, the enlightenment societies, the church, the other things that were necessary to keep these women in what was a utopian experiment that wasn't quite working out in the face of industrial America were prohibitive. So where do you go? Well, you have public schools training people in industrial work rhythm, particularly women. So you turn first to the Irish woman. So it was an opportunity for them. It's a really good question. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I'd like to say that you know I'm, I'm the guy when it comes to looking at Irish politics in the, in the late 19th century, but I'm not. It was done years ago. Oscar Hanlon said, I think I mentioned Hanlon earlier, Oscar Hanlon said it best. By 1860, the Irish discovered that their numbers and their ability to vote as laws allowed the Irish to begin to vote more regularly as they were naturalized, that their numbers allowed them, and this is the beginning of the political ward bosses and so on, that if you think of Honey Fitz or James Michael Curley or Frank Skeffington in the last terrar, that world began to emerge. And so if in fact that is on the seal, and I speak, as I'm sure it is, and I speak without full knowledge having researched it, that's because basically the city is controlled uh, in terms of voting, the city is controlled by the Irish. And Hanlon would say that most cities like Boston had begun to go to Irish political structures by about 1860. By 1894, things were pretty well entrenched. I can remember, my mother was the, a secretary in the police department here, and I remember religiously as a kid wearing my St. Patrick's Day green carnation on St. Patrick's Day and Greek Independence Day blue on Greek Independence Day, and I didn't know why I was wearing the flower, but I knew I'd better. Uh, and there's a rationale there, and that speaks to the politics of the 1960s. Good question also. Yes, ma'am. Well, you know, I, I was brought up very Irish. Um, that's the sort of mug that makes you say he's Irish, you know, that kind of thing. And I married into the Murphys, so I mean, I sort of kept the tradition going. Um, I grew up in the Highlands, up in St. Margaret's Parish, went to Keith, uh, and then to Merrimack, uh, and then uh, to graduate school in upstate New York, University of Rochester. 
when I got to Rochester, um, I was trained as a good Irish Catholic boy um, by what was the country's largest center for Marxism. So here I was, this nice Irish Catholic boy with a bunch of Marxists. And I began to think about the fact that I didn't want to just, um, I was a student of Eugene Genovese, who was a country, when Time Magazine went for the counterculture comment on the back, if you go back to the July 4th, 1976 edition, it's Genovese commenting on it. A uh, very good guy, taught me how to think. I just didn't, dis didn't agree with him in terms of what he said very often. But I sure respected him, and he just recently passed away in, in Atlanta. I miss him. Miss him. Um, at Rochester, I was encouraged by my professors to think about what I loved. Uh, and when I closed my eyes, I was always very homesick for Lowell. Thought I'd spend the rest of my life probably teaching at the University of Lowell in those days, at U Lowell. Um, and knew that there was a terrific story that had never been told because one of the things I did is I took a Genovese class in American history where they forced me to read a lot of, of immigration history. And then when I defended my dissertation, they knew I was focusing on that, so I sort of had to become an expert quickly. I learned relatively early on I could get access to records, specifically uh, records in the uh, Sisters of Notre Dame de Nemours in Ipswich, Massachusetts. Those were the uh, French, which we had to translate, accounts of the Know Nothing attacks uh, on St. Patrick's Convent. And I also knew that there were good locks and canals record and that the Baker Business Library at Harvard University had a series of really good records in place, and that I was going to also look in the Archdiocese of Boston at the civil registers, particularly baptismal records. So when I put all that together, at a point in American history when people were saying, tell the story of the people rather than the story of the great leaders, tell a good story, uh, I realized there was a terrific story in Lowell, and what people were doing is sort of overlaying the Irish into Lowell without integrating them into Lowell, and that's what the book hopefully did. I must say, I'm impressed with the quality of the questions. This side is doing better, you should know, on this side. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, a possible comedy question. Mm -hmm. the, um, was known to be a conduit for the pioneer and a Mm -hmm. the Fitzgeralds and the Kennedys, right. and there was a great concentration on immigration in the beginning of the book, particularly discrimination um, towards the Irish. And um, it, it caught my attention that Lowell High seemed to stand out um, in quite a favorable way. It did. Um, I had no knowledge of how progressive it was, mm -hmm. and it, it seemed to stand in contrast with the um, discrimination Well, let me raise three points. Um, I'll pick on Genovese since he's with us in spirit tonight, all right? Um, when I was at the, University of Ro uh, at the University of Rochester and I was you know, hopelessly over my head um, as a 21 or two Mary Jane year old kid with all these really smart people from Princeton undergraduate days and I was just completely sort of outclassed by them. Um, Eugene Genovese made me read all the books Samuel Eliot Morrison wrote, and he had a wonderful sense of humor. Um, he, I remember my first graduate paper, and I still remember it, and can break out even to this day in a sweat at night if I think about it. He used a big red pen, and I thought I was, you know, I'd done well at Merrimack, and I thought I was a pretty smart guy. All things considered, comma, Mr. Mitchell, comma, I should say you are a neat typist. <laughs> well, you know, I, I do the weekly higher education blog for the Huffington Post and for Academ uh, and for today's campus um, these days. And there isn't a day when I sit down at, on Sunday morning uh, that I, uh, we go to mass on Saturday night, I might add, in case you're wondering, <laughs> on, on, um, Saturday, on Sunday morning that I don't think about that red ink. I can still, be, I, it's slightly angled, it's on the right hand side, I know exactly where it is. Genovese didn't tell me that uh, uh, Admiral Morrison had written 50 books, and I had uh, eight weeks to read them. Oh. Yeah, nice guy. But what he did is he sent, in this proper Yankee tradition, in this proper Brahmin tradition, he and Betsy Fox Genovese, his wife, whose uh, father, Edward Fox, was a professor at, no, it was professor at Cornell, but he and, uh, and her mother 
uh, had had uh, Genovese in the 1930s. Uh, and so she sent this letter saying, my name is Betsy Fox Genovese, my husband was, my father was Edward Fox at Cornell, and I'm married to Eugene Genovese. I'd like to introduce you to this promising young graduate student, Brian Mitchell. Um, so I went uh, to, uh, Gen to Samuel L. A. Morrison's house at number, his statues on the Commonwealth Mall at number 44 Brimmer Street, and I borrowed, actually he's here tonight, Eugene, you may not remember this, I borrowed your trench coat. I borrowed his trench coat and cut my hair short enough that my ears showed, uh, which was really short, uh, and embarrassingly short, in fact, because I had giant ears, um, and uh, borrowed a tie from my father and went to Morrison's house where you were ushered into the second floor um, uh, of the uh, library of 44 Burmese Street by a Swiss maid because, and I'm from Lowell, as we all know, the Swiss, which is the French district in Switzerland, speak the best French, so you'd always have a Swiss maid from the Geneva district. I knew that, of course. <laughs> and from Keith Academy, I could barely, from Father Fredini, I could barely understand because all the Irish kids sort of gave up to the French Canadian kids, just hope for the B or the C. I, I, gave, I gave the best translation I could. She said, sit down and wait here. I could follow that, so that was fine. And I got back, and this is 1975, and Genovese's joke about me was illustrative. He said, well, congratulations, Mr. Mitchell has achieved something class that no one of us has ever else achieved. He is, in fact, the first Irishman ever allowed in the front door of number 44 Brimmer Street. <laughs> so was there discrimination? And Gene, I thought your trench coat looked darn good, incidentally. I don't remember you giving it back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. He's older than I am. He doesn't <laughs> He's tired. He should be asleep now. Um, at any rate, um, the discrimination was very pronounced. Let's face it, the Bank of Boston was, we may not have thought about it, but it was the Protestant bank. You didn't bank at the Bank of Boston historically. You banked at Fleet, what became Fleet Bank or something like it, but you were Charlotte or you know, New England merchants or something like that. You wouldn't bank there. Um, the second point I'd make, uh, so my point is that's 1975. The second point I'd make is that's why Boston College uh, was founded. It was founded essentially because the Irish couldn't get into Harvard which was barely past its clerical school days uh, and was only beginning to rethink under Charles Eliot and some of the others what, were go what was going on. The third point I'd make is that Lowell never had a large resident Protestant upper and middle, middle and upper class. All the money went to Boston. So there was, you know, there were great homes in Lowell on the hills. Any of the hills around, this, around the town have really nice um, Queen Anne style and, and French mansard style homes and the like, and it's all true. But it wasn't big money. So in some respects, Lowell was progressive precisely because it lacked the thing that would make it not progressive, which is money. And the money classes that would want, you know, what, we would, what you would find today, which is the private school that so many of the Bucknell kids came from, the private schools, the Dalton Academies, and th those kinds of things in New York. So as a result, it was possible to be progressive, but it was progressive in a very particular way. And the way it was progressive was it incorporated and inculcated the best traditions that took you beyond the old clerical, classical, French, and Greek, I'm sorry, Greek and Latin training, and gave you new useful arts that also corresponded precisely with industrial work rhythm. So it, it was progressive because it had a role to play, and it was, I guess the way to define it is the way they define it in the contemporary uh, political situation here is workforce preparation. It was all about workforce preparation, and that was good because that's the way the world was headed. Really good questions. You have redeemed yourself as this side <laughs> from the base of that question. We'll take maybe one question or two, if that's okay, Dave. One more question, he says. So make it a good one. Choose. What about Cardinal O'Connell? Oh, uh, well, I think Cardinal O'Connell was, Card sure, Cardinal O'Connell was right. Uh, if, you're, if, if the question was, as I think it was, well, was Cardinal O'Connell moving uh, to provide additional options by creating a parochial school system that went to the secondary level because of discrimination? The answer is absolutely. Uh, and my argument to you is that's in a sense where I think the contemporary church has made a serious mistake because it's one of the things I've noticed having lived away for 25 years is that you still see lots of families in other parts of the country where the neighborhoods and the churches are more robust and dynamic than you do uh, in the trouble-plagued Boston Archdiocese historically over the past 20 years. And I think the reason for that is the absence of priests and the inability to bring in the lay folks to the extent that is possible 
has meant that you haven't created these sort of alternative traditions that has kept the populace that is at least namesake Catholic historic, historically tied to the Catholic Church. And my recommendation, I actually, I'm, I'm, I'm a trustee. I was a chair of the board at Merrimack until July because I went to Merrimack. And I feel very strongly about, send your children to Merrimack. And so I feel very strongly about Merrimack College. Um, and I sat down uh, with uh, uh, Cardinal O'Malley. Uh, and I made this case to him. And uh, apart from, I thought two things. One, he was mildly interested. And two, he wanted to get away from me as fast as he could. <laughs> <laughs> so there you have it. Yes, one more question, Dave? Yeah. Uh, just add a little postscript. I just want to add that you remember Lowell High School was also the first co-education high school in the United States. So they also trained the woman to be on campus. Well, that's part of the story, though, when you think about it. <laughs> I, mean, I was trying so hard to get him out of what he was about to say. <laughs> and that was good for industrial purposes, because they're the ones who went into the mills. Remember, I'll leave you with this thought. Remember that the, the world that grew up after the women got into the mills was largely matriarchal. You know, I often say to the children, with apologies, Mary Jane, uh, I'm the head of the household, and their response is, well, we'll check with mom. <laughs> if, I, if, I think, if, I think, if I think of um, my father-in-law as an example, he tells a wonderful quick story that will illustrate the point about the matriarchal nature of Irish society. Uh, he was the valedictorian of Keith Academy. He's the oldest surviving member of the United States Postal Union. Not Dan Murphy, if many of you know him. He's 95 years old. And he was the boxing champion of, I think it was the European theater in World War II. He shook your hand into the 80s, and your penmanship was never the same <laughs> kind, kind, kind of guy. Well, he graduated in 1935. He, he was the youngest guy ever uh, put into the post office in Lowell. He took the exam the day after he turned 18, August 31st. The exam was on September 1st. In 1935, he graduated as valedictorian from Keith. Uh, it never occurred to him that he'd go to college. Uh, in the middle of the worst part of the Depression, so he took the best paying civil service job he could. He was part-time, he was full-time, more than full-time, 80, 68 hours a week as a, as a temporary for two years. By the time he was about 19 or 20, he was a full-time postal uh, uh, employee. Uh, bought his parents, they were living in the flats, bought his parents a house four or five doors up from uh, Sacred Heart Church, uh, and it's a three-decker. Uh, bought it in uh, one year and had paid it off in two years. And when he was getting married, after he came back from the war, he turned in all his, had always turned in all his income to his mother and he was given, took a small allowance. Uh, he said, I think I'll buy a coat, uh, a Chesterfield at Newman's, I think it was, if I recall correctly. And she said, why would you do that? And he said, well, it's cold because I walk over and take a cab back from what became, uh, the girl who became his, Mary Jane's mother, my mother-in-law, in the acre the Hafees from, from the Acre, from St. Patrick's, actually. Oh, good. I'm glad you all know him. <laughs> Jim, Jimmy, Jimmy Hafey was Mary Jane's uncle. Ah, that's good. Good for you. Nice family. Um, they like me. That's why I think they're such a nice family. Um, so at any rate, um, his mother said, well, you don't have to worry about that. You can buy a car. And this is in 1951 dollars. And he said, what do you mean I can buy a car? What are you talking about, uh, Ma, he said. And she said, well, and this is in $51, you have over $50,000 in the bank. He just turned over his check for 15 years, including all his, the money he earned. And the, that's the way it was. Uh, that's what happened. The children turned over their check. The, the mother essentially paid the bills, or if, whether she did or didn't, managed the household. And it became a family enterprise. It's the beauty of Lowell. That's what the mills offered, the ability to turn in the check and make sure that you could move to the house on, what is that street, Mary Jane? On Andrew Street uh, by the old Sacred Heart. Uh, and that made a difference. That's why the rhythm was so important. Look, it was fun. So thank you all. OK, thank you. Uh, Garrett, if you could make your way up here. Well, Garrett's coming up. A couple of commercials. We want to say thank you to Middlesex for providing the space, of course. Want to say thank you to the, yes. We want to say thank you to the Ancient Order of Hibernians who actually uh, gave us our treats tonight. So make sure that you take, no soda bread, sorry. Should have had soda bread. And we want to say thank you to Lowell National Park. Uh, you know, without them, 
we, they're filming this and it'll be up on YouTube, so wave hi to your kids or something. <laughs> Okay, let's see how well technology works. Okay, the term Anamkara in Irish means soul friend. And we've had 30 years of celebrating Irish culture. First celebration, actually, is recorded in 1833. Historians ha have to throw that in. But St. Pat's has been celebrating Irish Cultural Week for the past 30 years. Lots of folks have helped us. There have been so many. When we made out the original list, who should we say thank you to? It went on and on and on. So we had to cut it off somewhere. But we'd like to make this an annual event. So we want to say thank you to uh, some people. First of all, we want to say thank you for Dr. Mitchell for all the work that he's done. It's been um, great to have him as a resource. He's been now twice to Lowell since he's been back in the area and for starting everything off. So we want to say thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> My favorite stalker. <laughs> Thank you so much. This means a great deal. Thank you. Our next recipient is Walter Hickey. Walter has his own fan club. They're probably here tonight. But Walter, as some of you know, works for the, oh, I was going to say National Park Service, National <laughs> Archives, National Archives. And Walter is a walking trove of some very odd information, and sometimes very useful, too. When Walter and I get digging with some info, you wouldn't believe what we come up with. It scares us. Uh, but Walter has been invaluable with uh, tracing some of the new lines of research that we've come up with. Um, those of you who read the blog, and I hope you do. How many read the blog? OK, I want to see all hands up. We have cards over here. And on the cards are all the contact info for Facebook, um, for our blog, et cetera. We post every week something new in Lowell Irish history, so please keep up with us. But we want to say thank you to Walter. He has been there behind the scenes. You know Walter doesn't like standing up in front. That's why I'm making him stand here. Um, <laughs> but we want to say thank you for all the hard work that you've done. Thank you very much. You want to speak? You want to speak? Yeah. Thomas, Garrett, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If, if the honorees are comfortable enough to speak, please do. Walter could go on for a while, so just. When, when Karen and I walked in this evening, the first thing we're greeted with is that I was informed uh, that I was to sing Danny Boy to you. I quickly disabused Dave of that notion. That ain't going to happen. Uh, I, I want to thank the committee and everyone for this. It, it's very much appreciated. Uh, I first listened to Dr. Mitchell back in, I think, 1981. He did a presentation at the Pollard Library as part of the Immigration and Lowell Project, and I had just come on uh, as an assistant with that, to that with Donna Mayo. And that's about four years after I really got involved in Lowell history. I started when I was teaching back in the 70s, because like most of us, and I'm going to keep this real short, because Dave is right, I can go on for hours. <laughs> Growing up, I knew nothing about the history of the city, and I knew nothing about the history of the Irish in the city. It just wasn't talked about. And it was only when I was teaching seventh grade in Lowell that I developed, along with John Haston at the Daly School, uh, some educational units on the early history of Lowell. And then I worked at the Pollard Library for seven years in the Special Collections Room. And back in 1989, I was asked to join the National Archives and Records Administration which I am about to depart the National Archives and Records Administration. There's an advantage to being a senior citizen. <laughs> but what has also happened in the last four years, I got a call from Dave one day. Uh, I'm going up to the cemetery next week with Colm Donnelly. Would you like to come along with us? Well, I had not met Colm. So of course I said yes. So in the rain and the sleet, the three of us like idiots are walking around looking at gravestones at St. Patrick's Cemetery. 
and we started talking about what's going to happen from that. And it started, of course, with Hugh, and the correct pronunciation is Kamiski. We're, we're trying to convince Colm of that. And I said, well, I'll take a look. I know there are court records involving Hugh because I'd seen them some 20 years earlier. Well, it turns out there were two, about three or four dozen court records involving Hugh. But what has also happened because of that and because of Dr. Mitchell's book, which is the only contemporary, good, solid, documentary-based history we have, I have had the luxury of time, and it's about to become more time, to look at resources that in some ways weren't available when he was doing his research. And the biggest thing with that are the digitized newspapers, which we can access from home. And that has led us to so many different fields. If you've read the blog, you would have come across the story of Father McCool suing Father McDermott. <laughs> Wonderful story. I stumbled onto that in the court records. And all of these things, one thing is leading to another. I'll find something, I'll pass it along to Dave. He'll find something, he'll pass it to me. We've never seen this before. And it's like, where is this going to end? So it's a continuing thing. It is a true joy. And I think they could have picked a better picture than myself clearing a grave <coughs> back before Dave's last talk. But a lot of this, too, <coughs> and somehow he has a picture of me from the National Archives when the 1920 census was being opened. But I also share one thing with Dr. Mitchell. I am not a historian. I'm a historical dilettante at best. But like Dr. Mitchell, I too married a Murphy. <laughs> and she's there constantly. And I thank you very much. I told you he was going to talk. Uh, our next honoree is Dick Howe. Uh, Dick, by the way, did you bring any of your books tonight, Dick? Just one? Really? Dick has a new book out, if you don't know. So it's at Barnes & Noble, I believe because he hangs around Barnes & Noble to watch people pick it up. But uh, also at um, where the Lowell Gallery, I believe. Uh, where else is it available? Uh, Don't be humble. Uh, well, I have a bunch of them in my living room. OK, in his living room. <laughs> Contact Dick. When Dr. Donnelly came over from Queen's University that first year, and we're just digging up, digging up, one of the first people that came over to see what was happening do you know about Dick's blog? Fantastic, fantastic writer. But one of the first things we did was who lived here. And Dick just went and started digging and digging. And he's been a valuable researcher for us uh, with the archaeological dig that's gone on. He's also helped us greatly with the Civil War database. Uh, he's come over. And in his blog, he's keeping alive Irish culture in Lowell, uh, some of the mass moments that you've reproduced, et cetera. So we want to say thank you to Dick Howe. Well, uh, thank you very much. And yes, my, my first book, it's uh, mostly a, a photographic history of Lowell. And I have to thank uh, Dave and St. Patrick's because uh, I was limited in space. And so I tried to choose things were emblem that were emblematic of Lowell and uh, St. Patrick's is the parish that's depicted. So there's not only a photo of Cardinal O'Connell emerging after St. Mass. Uh, that at the top, at the bottom, is a picture of the nuns uh, scrubbing their clothes. Uh, and I, I think there was uh, a nice symmetry there. But thank you very much for your contribution. Um, if I could also plug the Registry of Deeds. Uh, we've got all 10 million records scanned. They're all available on the website, lowelldeeds.com. You can go back to 1629. Uh, one of my favorite documents is from the 1890s. It's a deed for Fairmont Street. It contains a, a restriction. It says, I convey this property to Sarah Brown in the condition that she never convey it to anyone born in Ireland or descended from anyone born in Ireland. Uh, so those things actually did exist. And my final point is on the wall in the room where I do all my reading and typing is the framed naturalization papers for my great-grandfather, Joseph Gorman. And all over the naturalization papers are these red stamps from the Board of Registrars of Voters in the city of Lowell with dates. And so I could only presume that to vote, you had to show up 
to prove you're an American citizen, but like they do sometimes in the Middle East now with the uh, ink stamps on the thumbs, they stamp your papers to show that you could only vote once. And that was what prompted my question. The intersection of Irish, Lowell, and politics has really defined my life, and uh, it's proved for a very interesting life. So thank you very much. Our next honoree is Donna Reedy from the Lowell Ancient, uh, Ladies' Ancient Order of Hibernians. Donna is one of those people that you get an email from and you go, oops, okay, here we go again. <laughs> because Donna started many years ago, she recognized the number of Irish, there were tens of thousands of burials in St. Patrick's with no markers. Uh, even in yard one, there were just hundreds and hundreds with no markers whatsoever. And Donna took it upon herself that they should be remembered. And for years now, she's done her own fundraising along with the Ladies Ancient Order of Hibernians to put markers into St. Patrick's in every fall in, Walter, are we doing one in the spring this year? A so. uh, spring tour of the cemetery. Um, and Donna uh, commemorates those names each year by adding markers in her mercy drive. So we want to say thank you, Donna, for remembering them. Of course, I always have a few words to say. I don't want to forget anybody, but I'm very honored to receive this award from the Irish Cultural Committee, and I gratefully accept it on behalf of the Lowell Hi Ancient Order of Hibernians, the Ladies and Men's Order. Over the last decade, I've had the privilege of chairing the Mercy Drive Project, which was established by the Ladies Ancient Order of Hibernians in 2001, when we discovered that there were many early Irish ancestral unmarked graves at St. Patrick's Cemetery. Many thanks are in order to those who are responsible for the success of the Mercy Drive Project. The Ladies AOH Division I and the Men's AOH Division 19 have been major contributors over the last decade and whose help and support throughout the years has been and is critical to our cemetery work still in progress. A special thank you to my husband who's always there to help through all my endeavors and of course Nancy Rudolph and all her talented friends for producing a wonderful Irish show that carried our Mercy Drive project for the last two years. And while I'm up here and I have the mic, I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate the Irish Cultural Committee on their 30th anniversary and thank them for providing the city of Lowell with 30 wonderful years of events promoting Irish cultural heritage. Thank you so much. The work that we've talked about has been part of UMass Lowell's Irish Partnership Center, and that has been a group of people, uh, along with Queen's University in Belfast, who have come over and done the archaeological digs. You don't know what a thrill it is for a kid from the Acre. Sorry you aren't from the Acre, Dr. Mitchell, but okay. You know, we can't all be from the Acre. But for a kid from the Acre who's heard about you, Comiskey, his whole, and I say Comiskey, his whole life, to go from the front yard of St. Pat's, digging up, seeing the foundation of an Irish shanty, and then actually being able to go to Tyrone and stand in you, Comiskey's yard. And you know, I've had the pleasure of doing that, but the work of the Irish Partnership Center, they've been supportive three years of digging. Uh, you know, they are really helping us give the identity to our ancestors that they deserve. Uh, two of the members, uh, who we'd like to honor, uh, Dr. Frank Talty, who would like to be from the Acre, but he's not, and Dr. Steve McCarthy. Now, actually, I had another picture here, and if he was here, I'll, since I'll tell you what I would have shown, it's the only picture of Dr. Frank Talty actually digging with the spade. But I said, oh, I shouldn't show that one, because he said, take this picture, no one will believe that I work. But I'm not going to show that one. Since he's here, not here, I can tell the story. And Dr. Steve McCarthy. And then, to be really honest, the woman who keeps it all together, Victoria Denoon. Victoria is, has been at every piece of the travel. She has kept everybody together. She's kept the vision going. And Victoria, I know if it wasn't for you, 
we would not be here right now saying thank you. So, Victoria, in the name of the partnership. Um, thank you very much. I just want to say very briefly, um, thank you to um, St. Patrick's um, Irish Cultural Committee. Um, honestly, Dave, that was that was very kind. Thank you. I feel so unworthy to be <laughs> standing up here because it is it was the work of Dr. Donnelly. Um, when Chancellor Meehan went over to Queen's University in Belfast, he sat down to meet with this group from the um, Centre for Archaeological Fieldwork. He sort of, I think, must have thought, what am I doing meeting with people from archaeology? We don't have an archaeology department. But suddenly up on the PowerPoint screen came images of Lowell and it was through um, Dr. Mitchell's book um, and Colm's reading of that that he learnt all about what happened there. He found out about Hugh and started telling the story that's been going for three years now. And if it wasn't also for people like Dave and Walter and the research that they're doing, I don't think it would be in its third year. So thank you very much. And I hope you'll come and visit the dig if you haven't when the folks come back this year. Thank you. Each of the honorees, uh, we have a vase for you uh, brought over from Galway Crystal Factory. So if you'd pick that up before you leave, Dr. Mitchell is here to sign his book. If any of you are interested, 40% uh, of it is tax deductible. It, <laughs> it is. It's a charitable donation. All, all proceeds, of course, go towards the continuance. We want your help. We want your uh, cooperation. We want you to contact us. We have lots of events that go on throughout the year. Um, we need you in order to continue. We thank you so much for being here. Take care. Good night. Please help yourself to refreshments.